Join us March 23rd and 24th for the 2019 Meet the Masters of Income property. Let's break this down and look at some of the strengths of income property as an asset class. I found that this event is really helpful because I'm totally a newbie to real estate investment. And so I picked up so much information. One of the great things about it is that it's so fragmented, right? Embrace the fragmentation. Uh, I've actually been learning a lot about the tax benefits to uh, real estate and a lot of, I've been investing actually well over 10 years now and I learned a lot of new things today. The other advantage of this weekend is networking. Meeting new property managers, meeting new area specialists and, and seeing the product they have to offer, that changes year by year. Register now at jasonhartman.com slash masters. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Holistic Survival Show with Jason Hartman. The economic storm brewing around the world is set to spill into all aspects of our lives. Are you prepared? Where are you going to turn for the critical life skills necessary to survive and prosper? The Holistic Survival Show is your family's insurance for a better life. Jason will teach you to think independently, to understand threats, and how to create the ultimate action plan. Sudden change or worst case scenario, you'll be ready. Welcome to Holistic Survival, your key resource for protecting the people, places, and profits you care about in uncertain times. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome Gregory Wrightstone. He is the best-selling author of Inconvenient Facts, the science that Al Gore doesn't want you to know. Greg, welcome. How are you? Oh, very good, thank you, on a cold, cold day in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yes, I bet it is cold up there, but not as cold as it is in Chicago. When I mm-hmm. woke up yesterday morning and took the dog for a walk here in South Florida, uh, it was exactly 100 degrees colder in Chicago by wind chill wow. factor, the feels like temperature than it was here in South Florida. <laughs> so, wow. Wow. And you know, that really begs the question back in, I think it was the late seventies, Al Gore was promoting that there was going to be an ice age and that we all had to watch out for that. And that was the mm-hmm. big, the big mm-hmm. boogeyman. And then he changed, I guess that didn't sell. So he kind of changed his, uh, his pitch to global warming And then, you know, there's debatable evidence on either side of that. We're going to go into that deeply, of course, on this interview. And then it's climate change. What really is going on? That's a good jumping off point here. So we are in a warming trend. We just are. But the fact of the matter is that warming trend started over 300 years ago at the depths of what was called the Little Ice Age, the horrifically cold Little Ice Age. So actually, that year when it started warming, we know the year was 1695, the end of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. And we've been warming in fits and starts ever since then. But one of the key things to know, we really didn't start adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in in earnest until it was that post-World War II economic boom. And we've been adding more and more and more and more every year. And this is really the big thing that we've got in the climate change debate is, is it warming? Yes, it is. Is CO2 increasing? Yes, it is. And does CO2 have a warming effect on the atmosphere? Yes, it does. But I will argue that the warming effect we see from additional CO2 is greatly overwhelmed by those same natural forces that have been driving temperatures, well, really since the dawn of time, but in this warming trend uh, for the last more than 300 years. So what Al Gore needs your listeners to understand or to believe is that those natural forces driving temperatures up and down and up and down for thousands and millions of years suddenly ceased in the middle of the 20th century. And now it's all being driven by man, man-made man increases in CO2. And there are those who actually say that, you know, it was really like we entered this whole new era in the 1600s, actually. You can slice and dice this a million ways. Uh, mm-hmm. And some would say that the warming that we're having now is caused by uh, increased solar activity. The sun is just hotter than it was before, and there's more solar flares, and there's just more going on over in, in that 
a segment of the solar system. How do we know? Well, we do know that the horrifically cold, what was called the worst part of the Little Ice Age, was called the Maunder Minimum. And it was called the Maunder Minimum because the solar activity really went to zero, mm -hmm. which we're approaching a new solar minimum, grand, what's called Grand Solar Minimum, now that we're just going into. And people I respect are predicting uh, cooling for the next 30 or 40 years. But frankly, the climate's going to do what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the past warming trends over the last 10,000 years and see what happened with them, I think that our current warming trend we're in right now, it'll probably last similar length as the other ones. So we might see another 80 or 100, 150 years of continued warming. But the key here is if we look through history back 4,500 years, there's a strong correlation between the rise and fall of temperatures and the rise and fall of civilizations. When in the warming trends like we're in right now, historically, food is plentiful, crops are bountiful, every, it's prosperous, uh, they can grow, and, uh, grow lots of food and feed your subjects if you were the emperor. People have time to dream, to invent. And, and so we see these warming periods being very prosperous. And then cold is when it gets bad. Yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad you brought that up. And, and by the way, before I talk about this, let me just share something. I, I'm looking at an article, a data, July 13th, 2015, that talks about a mini ice age coming that will hit around 2030, and there will be a 60% fall in solar activity. So mm -hmm. if mankind is creating the warming, if and that's a ginormous if, of course, right? But if that's mm -hmm. happening, then wouldn't it actually benefit the Earth and benefit all the inhabitants of the Earth to create more warming before 2030 when the solar activity falls by 60%? You know, this is the problem. Like, nobody ever asks, of course, there's, is it happening, right? That's one major question. Uh, you mm -hmm. say it is, right? Yeah. And then yeah. the second major question is, what is the cause? And there's a million ways you can slice and dice that. And then the third major question is, is it bad? Like nobody yep. actually asks if it's good or bad. The amount of available farmland would increase. I mean, there are very harsh places around the world that are cold. I don't know. Is warming even bad? If you've seen the back of my SUV, I've got a bumper sticker that says, I heart CO2. And when I speak, <laughs> I've got buttons, with I heart CO2 buttons. What I see is a thriving, prospering, and greening earth. Humanity is benefiting from it. The title of my talk, usually when I talk, is how rising temperatures and increasing CO2 are benefiting the earth and humanity. And what we see, looking at what actually is happening, not speculation about what might occur 50 or 80 years in the future based on failed climate models, but what's actually happening today, we see all these things that we think are getting worse are actually improving. We're seeing that forest fires are, have been in a long-term decline, even in California, mm -hmm. completely opposite of what your listeners, I'm sure they would, believe. Would, would fires think are increasing. based on the recent news, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. All right. Even in California, for, the number of fires have decreased by about 50% in the last 30 years. Now, granted, the area burned has increased, mm -hmm. but that's more of a reflection of bad forest management rather than well, and also and also PG&E and bad power, you know, power line management. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that they are the main uh, ignition source. But yeah. even so, fires are still in decline. Yeah. And we actually we've seen a one thousand percent increase over the last forty years of people living in fire prone areas. Yet the fire numbers have decreased, mm -hmm. and yeah. and that's a good relationship there because the soil, it, the main driver of, of fire decreases, is an increasing soil moisture due to climate change. Mm -hmm. or an increasing soil moisture, right? Right. just opposite, again, of what we're being told. Yeah, it's really quite amazing. You know, human beings seem to have this propensity to just want to not only believe, but promulgate doom and gloom ideologies. And yeah. I guess it's because since the beginning of time until just recently, we lived in this environment of scarcity and lack and danger. And now... We don't have much scarcity and lack and danger. I mean, yes, we have a little bit of it, but <laughs> compared to compared to what, right? Compared to history, we have mm -hmm. like we're totally safe nowadays. We have a massive abundance. Most people are way too fat, you know. I mean, there's abundance galore everywhere, right? You know, you look at anybody's home, including mine, and there's so many 
things. There's just so many pieces of things in my house. It's mind boggling. We just have stuff coming out of our ears. We have all this abundance, but our, our old brain is still focused on the threat. And I think by talking about the threat, people can virtue signal they can act like they're good people, that like they're, they care. There's just all kinds of weird psychological things that come into play. You know? Yeah, and what you're, what you're talking about, if you look in the rearview mirror, let's look in our recent past 100 or 150 years, it's been called the 5,000-year leap. We've had prosperity beyond anything in human history and advances beyond anything in human history. Decline of suffering, what you're talking about. So we look at what's actually happened. Well, we see that, my goodness, civilization and humanity are, have been thriving up to this point. But these ayatollahs of alarmism, they look in the future and predict nothing but doom and dismay. <laughs> due to, due, I, right? Ayatollahs of alarmism. I love that. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. That's a good one. So, okay. it's a, again, I'm, I'm a real big proponent of the benefits of, of rising temperatures and increasing CO2. Everybody listening, every uh, chicken little listening is going to say, well, what about the, the sea levels? Aren't they going to rise? Yeah. Aren't the polar caps yeah. going to melt and we're all going to be yeah. drowned? I mean, you know, or uh, maybe, maybe the real estate play is to buy oceanfront property in Phoenix. You know, I don't know. Well, you're right about rising temperature is the driving force of rising sea levels. But the, the key is, is it because of us? Is there a human influence on this? And if we look at glacial retreat and rising sea levels, those two go hand in hand. The rising sea levels are fueled by land-based glacier melt. And we see that both of these started in the early 1800s, long before we started adding CO2 to the atmosphere in any, any significant amounts. And the rate of sea level rise and glacial retreat has remained fairly constant. So this is something that's been natural. What does Al Gore want your listeners to believe? That since 1800, the rise in the sea level to maybe mid-20th century, that was, all, that was all natural. Oh, but now it's all human. Mm -hmm. That's what they want you to believe. Well, because it's profitable to promote it. I mean, Al Gore is going to be the first environmental billionaire, right? He's making a fortune off this. Yep. You know, yep. Chicken Little is a very lucrative position, especially when you have all sorts of businesses and, you know, set up that either promote the idea or are enriched from the idea. Oh, absolutely. But again, you painted the great points there. Is it, is it our fault? And is it harmful or, or beneficial? Uh, again, living in the real world, I see droughts declining. That's, that's a scientifically provable statement right there. Forest fires decreasing. Intense heat waves, believe it or not, are in decline. Mm -hmm. We do see more precipitation, which is due to a rising temperature. It means that more water vapor is incorporated in the atmosphere, which leads to more precipitation. Some would argue it leads to more flooding, and it may. But what we really see throughout the earth is a greening of the earth due to CO2 fertilization effect combined with increases in precipitation. There's probably the best example is the southern Sahara, an area known as the Sahel. 300,000 square kilometers of former barren desert have been being transformed into lush grasslands. People are, are now farming there, moving back in, mm -hmm. gazelles, even amphibians are moving back in there. And if your listeners don't believe me, they can just Google two words, NASA and greening, and mm -hmm. see what NASA has to say about it. Right, right. According to NASA, up to 50% of the earth is what they call greening. In other words, vegetation is increasing. Less than 4% of the earth is what they call browning mm -hmm. or desertification. The opposite, again, exactly opposite of what we're being told. Mm, yeah. Any uh, left-wing person that's, you know, been through the school system and the uh, university system in this country, and they're listening to this and they're going to say, well, you know, what do you know? Are you a scientist? Do you have a peer-reviewed paper on the subject? And here's the problem with the academic world. <laughs> well, the problem among other problems, <laughs> but one of the pro one of the many problems with that world is that you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. And for decades now, nobody that is taking an opposing view is getting any funding for any research. Yeah. It's unbelievable. All of the, it's like, I was talking to my girlfriend about this the other day, and we're talking about the culture war and how 
culture has decayed so much. And, and she's making the case that, you know, look, if you think the music is so bad and it has such a bad message nowadays, there are other people publishing good music. Listen to that. And I said, well, that music doesn't get funding very much. I mean, it gets some, of course, but, but you know, what, what gets funding is the sensational the the bad the negative you know the old saying in journalism is if it if it bleeds it leads right the things mm-hmm. that push the envelope get the funding they get the money they get the venture capital they get the crowdfunding for the movie deal they get the government grants for the scientists if you espouse these ideas inside of any american university you're going to be tarred and feathered I and mean, they're going to hang you they're going to lynch you you'll have a lynch mob after you yeah yeah and that's exactly right. And I see it a lot. I'm a geologist, so I've been... Oh, so you uh, actually do have credentials. <laughs> yeah. I've been studying the Earth's processes for 40 years now, including yeah. paleoclimate. Mm-hmm. I don't have a doctorate, but I've got a master's degree. And I've, of course, my new book... Uh, let, me, let me explain. My book is in Inconvenient Facts, the Science that Al Gore Doesn't Want You to Know. Mm-hmm. The website's inconvenientfacts.xyz. And I didn't set out to write a book. I really didn't. I set out to seek the truth Mm -hmm. because in climate change and global warming, we see we hear so much contradictory information. I I frankly didn't know who to trust. So what I did, I started out. I went back to the base raw data from NASA, from NOAA, from peer reviewed studies. I just got sucked into it because what I was finding, the science, the facts and the data was telling me that, my Lord, we're just everything that we're being told virtually everything is just opposite, 180 degrees opposite. You know, we just talked about fires. They, the media, intergovernmental plan on, on climate change, these official sources say, oh, well, fires are increasing because of man-made global warming. Just the opposite's happening. And I, so I got sucked into this. And this book was the result of that quest for the truth. And everything in that book, and when I speak, are all fact and science based. Everything's fully sourced and referenced. We've got a new smartphone app that's available for Android right now with all 60 of the inconvenient facts, the charts. You can have this information in the palm of your hand. I've got videos that I create linking to each one of the facts. Just finished one today on polar bears. Uh, the one I finished last week was the title was Global Warming Saves Lives. And I looked at the health impacts of rising or falling temperatures. In that video and in the book, I share that cold-related deaths are responsible for 20 times as many deaths as heat-related deaths. Mm -hmm. Again, completely opposite. in the Midwest right now. I mean, you know, it's... it's, Yeah. yeah. But this was a study, 74 million deaths, temperature-related deaths they looked at worldwide. Mm -hmm. And that's what their conclusion was, 20 times as many people died due to cold as Oh, and that's no surprise. I mean, it's much easier to die of cold than heat, right? You know, the the heat sort of limits itself to the, I think the highest recorded Mm -hmm. temperature ever on Earth is 131 degrees. You probably won't even die in that temperature. Okay, but you can yeah. certainly die in 30 below <laughs> or a lot. Right. A lot, right. Uh, that's lot op- again, again, that's opposite of what they're telling us. The latest national climate assessment stated that, you know, the temperature related deaths are increasing. Just they stated it flatly mm-hmm. and that it will continue to increase in the future when just the opposite is, in fact, happening. Mm-hmm. We're seeing fewer people dying. Global warming is actually causing a lessening of mortality, mm-hmm. temperature related mortality. Yeah, very interesting. What about Al Gore and democracy? I have a question here about Al Gore killing democracy. Have you written about that somewhere? No. I do have a blog on my website Uh that was some fascinating uh, commentaries. I do about one or two a week. Uh Oh, okay. Is CO2 really this villain that people think it is? I mean, it seems like the quick answer to all of this, assuming that the Al Gore crowd is right and that the chicken little crowd is right, right? Let's just give mm-hmm. them the benefit mm-hmm. of the doubt for a moment. Well, isn't the obvious solution to just reduce the population of the planet? I mean, a genocidal maniac could solve that problem pretty quick, right? I mean, humans are the scourge of the earth, according to this movement. You know, they're, right, right. They're, they're but, the but evil, in fact, you know? Right. Everything that we're, we're hearing about from the Green New Deal to leave it in the ground, get us off of fossil fuels... It all goes back to carbon dioxide. We got to stop they're breathing, demon- folks. Stop breathing. Yeah, they're, stop. they're demonizing what should be a what is a miracle molecule. Mm-hmm. It's a little over four hundred parts per million, and they're all a Twitter over over this increase, slight increase in CO two. Okay, we're at about we're four hundred six parts per million right now. 
okay? The average CO2 level on, in Earth's history prior to our current period was 2,600 parts per million, eight times plus, eight, eight plus times what it is today. And Earth thrived and prospered. It got as high as almost 8,000 parts per million, yet plants and animals thrived in it. So we're actually, and in fact, probably the scariest chart in my book is a chart of the last 140 million years of CO2 data showing that CO2 140 million years ago was at 2,500 parts per million, and it's almost a straight line decline down to what I call the line of death, which is 150 parts per million, which is the minimum threshold for plant life to exist. We got within a, a whisker of that at the end of the last ice age. We got to 182 parts per million, within 30 parts per million of what would be a true climate apocalypse, a CO2 level so low that plants can't survive. That would be bad. Why don't we hear anything about this idea that th this whole movement of people want to restrict plants' ability to breathe? The ability of vegetation yeah. to breathe is dependent on us evil humans exhaling CO2, right? And so we want to suffocate the plants. That's basically what they want to do, right? Yeah. If you look, again, in my book, I reference work done by... Uh, uh, CO2 science. They've got a great uh, website there. They document uh, studies of over 90 plant types. What would an increase of 300 parts per million do to those? And we see there, we would have an increase of about average 46% increase in crop growth if we increase through another three. Isn't that a good thing? Mm -hmm. That's a really good thing. We can feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. We can feed our popula our growing population because of increasing CO2. Mm -hmm. They don't listen to it. And they don't, they don't want to hear that. And you won't hear it from them. You're going to hear them bring up a million diversions. They're going to talk about species extinction. Well, what they never say is that 90 plus percent of the species that ever existed on this planet are gone today. Yep. You know, they were gone long before the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> okay. This is the normal course of life and death. It's just the way things work. They're going to make this argument and that argument, and they'll never stay on point. And they hang around with people that believe the exact same things they believe. You can't introduce an opposing viewpoint. You'll be shouted down. Two interviews I've done over the years uh, on the show here. One was a Berkeley professor, very nice to him, and uh, I let him state his case and everything. And he said, the world is overpopulated. Mm. And I said, well, weren't they saying that in the early 60s when we had like 3 billion people and now we have upwards of 7 billion? And he mm. says, yeah, he admitted they were saying that then. I, I, and I said, well, how do you know what the right number of people is for the earth to absorb, right? How, how, much, how, many, mm. how many humans can the earth handle, right? Is it 12 billion? Is it 20 billion? Is it 40 billion? How do you know? And he was just silent. He had no answer. This is a Berkeley professor who wrote a book on the topic, a PhD. He doesn't have an answer. He just decided arbitrarily that 7 billion is way too many. Yet he is arrogant enough to keep on living himself because that's certainly a right. choice, right? You know, he's arrogant enough to have children and overpopulate the planet even more. I guess the rules don't apply to him. Right, right. And that's very similar to what, uh, whenever Scott Pruitt was EPA director, this was November or so or October, he had something really important to say. He said, how arrogant is it for us to believe that we know what the ideal temperature of the earth was? I, I, isn't that hilarious? I mean, that's such an obvious Well, question. Dr. Michael yeah. Mann responded. He's from Penn State. Some people have said that he belongs in the state pen, not at Penn State, but for <laughs> falsifying data. But yeah. I would never say that because he's very light edges. Right. But uh, Dr. Michael Manson, well, of course we know what the ideal temperature was. It's the temperature of the earth before we started adding CO2. You know what that would put us? That is put squarely in the temperatures of the Little Ice Age. We know how badly that worked out. Yeah. During then, half the population of Iceland perished. It's thought that a third of the population, the entire earth, humans, died during that horrific time with crop failure, pestilence, and mass depopulation. That's what they want. That's okay with them. And, and again, we just, we just see time and time again, warming equates to just really good things to humanity and the earth. It's just a really weird argument, you know? Like, it actually really kind of shocks me that here in this modern era that this can actually survive any rational debate. 
I mean, it can't really, but <laughs> it does for some somehow. Another interview I did was with a uh, a woman, Elizabeth Colbert, staff writer for New Yorker and acclaimed field notes from a catastrophe, right? And she hung up on me during the interview. And uh, you know, she, she, I, I called back and she wouldn't answer the phone. Her publicist answered the phone and said, oh, she had to take another call. And I said, well, I'd mm. like to reschedule and just finish the interview. There were, you know, about five, six minutes left, probably. She just disappeared. And I, I didn't even ask her a tough question yet. I wasn't even debating anything with her, but she could tell, you know, that... I was going to ask some questions, and, and she couldn't handle it. So, so there's what you have, folks. That is the New Yorker magazine. That is a, a staff writer. I've got it all on tape, her hanging up. You know, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous what this has come to, you know? Oh, oh I get it. Well, I, was, I speak all over the country. I was in St. Louis in uh, early December. While I was speaking, we had three Antifa. How do you pronounce it? Antifa? Yeah, I Antifa, guess so. Yeah. Whatever Antifa, they are. Three, yeah. th- three command... And they got up and started screaming at me. They, they said, you have the blood of climate refugees on your hands. You've got, <laughs> you know, it was the police came and had to escort them out. So I, how can I sleep at what, night? What blood do they have on their hands? I mean, what about all the people who, because of these uh, energy restriction environments, people in third world countries who can't refrigerate their medicine? There are so many victims of this absolutely dictatorial elitist thinking that comes with this movement. You know, there's an old saying, you know, relating to communism when I say red, but, you know, green trees have red roots. And mm. uh, this is another gambit to just control people. That's really it what is, it amounts yeah, to. Yeah, if we look at this, there, there are two billion people in energy poverty around the world. There, there's a billion people around the earth with no electricity. Mm-hmm. Four million people a year die of preventable lung diseases because they're cooking over open fires, usually dried dung in their homes. They have no access to the fossil fuels that could save their lives. And these people want to destine these horribly poverty-stricken people to, to continuing generational poverty. And what you do by putting carbon taxes and increasing the cost of energy using expensive wind and solar power is your you actually, wind, wind power, the guillotine for birds in the, the guillotine in the air? Yeah. Go to the bottom of any windmill and you will see dead, decapitated birds all over the place. Okay? That's, yeah. that's what but you what, have. What you're doing there, that carbon tax is actually a regressive taxation system. And by that, I mean it impacts the poorest among us the most because the poorest spend the highest percentage of their income on energy. Oh, of course. I mean, I mean, look at what Obama said. You know, candidate Obama back in, you know, 2007 or 8, he made the stated goal of seeing gas prices go up to 6 or $7 a gallon. Now, do you think that's going to matter to Ariana Huffington and Al Gore? No, of course not. You know who it's going to mm-hmm. matter to? The gardener, okay, that has a lawnmower and a leaf blower in his truck, and he has to drive 40 miles from the poor area in which he lives in the outlying area to the rich area in the suburbs where he can get gardening jobs, right? Yeah. That gas price is going to destroy his life. It won't matter to anybody else. It won't matter to these mm-hmm. other politicians, mm-hmm. that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's actually, uh, well, I'm a uh, contributing writer for the Cornwall Alliance, which is a, a Christian group. And the group believes that oh, we now, we, now use, we know you're evil. You're a Christian. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, my goodness. Yeah, there's the nail in the coffin. We <laughs> believe that we should use all of our resources or in their language, all of God's creation for the betterment of mankind mm-hmm. and do it as good stewards. Of course. That sounds pretty reasonable. But what you'll find are a lot of people that disagree with that because they don't want us using all of all of our resources to benefit mankind. They want us to restrict fossil fuels. They don't want us to have reliable, inexpensive energy. They want unreliable, intermittent, expensive energy. And, and again, it, it just hurts the entire... And let me ask you something, right, too. Right, right. But, but, but you, the, you, the one thing you didn't say is, so long as it doesn't affect their life, they're yeah. still virtue signaling on social media, talking about how great they are and how much they care about the environment, yet they're driving their SUV to one of the biggest litter bugs on the planet, Starbucks, Okay, uh, liberal organization Starbucks, right, who is creating mountains of litter every day all around the world, not just in the U.S. They're not going to suffer with intermittent energy. They're not going to suffer with anything. They're just going to keep taking, taking, taking. Well, everybody below their elitist level suffers. 
as they jet off to their next uh, environmental conference in Copenhagen oh. or Finland or well, whatever. One, one, yeah, well, or at Davos, Switzerland, right, with all the private mm-hmm. jets, you know, to talk to have an environmental meeting. That's <laughs> absolutely absurd. You know, one of my friends I have these debates with, he's a total global warming believer. I mean, he's just bought and hook, line, and sinker. Young guy, university educated, of course, right? He decided when he was getting married last year that he was going to have his wedding with his his bride in the four corners of the world. So instead of just Mm. one local wedding, he was going to have four weddings around the planet. And, you know, just to make sure his carbon footprint is nice and high. And and I, I said to him, Danny, why are you doing that? That's just crazy. You know, I mean, and he makes all the rationalizations. Well, just it's just two seats on the plane, but it's not. He's going to have some friends come on some of these trips. And even if it is two seats, it's still increasing the carbon footprint. <laughs> Has he drunk the Kool-Aid? Oh, totally. Yeah. He's, yeah. Nobody practices what they preach here on this stuff, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a fact. Well, I'm trying to get the word out. I, I sometimes feel like a an old-time evangelist spreading the good news of the gospel of carbon dioxide. Well, and Because well, uh, people haven't heard it, and they, they need to know. They haven't. They do need to know. Um, what does your app do before you go? Just what does the app actually do? Is it just content, or does it actually, like, calculate or measure something? No, or? no, no. It, it does not. Okay. It, but it, what it does is I've got 60 inconvenient facts in the book, and mm-hmm. I have a very legible, readable chart for each one of those. And you can click, you can click a, uh, there's a learn more button. So there's text, you know, if you click on the the one called CO2 is not the primary greenhouse gas, you can learn about that. And I've also created videos that are linked to that. And then there, an important component is there's a, you can click to find out what the source and reference was for that that particular fact. Right, right. Uh, it's okay. powerful. That app is very handy when you are sitting at your hipster coffee shop with yep. the cup that you're about to throw into the landfill after driving your SUV there. You know, if you're having a debate with someone who just doesn't get it, you can pull out the app and show some charts yeah. and graphs and videos. Right, right. <laughs> if you're at Easter dinner with your idiot nephew that's majoring in sustainable development oh, at Florida God. State, yeah. and he tells you the polar bears are going stink, you can go, oh, wait a minute, Jimmy. Here, here's a chart of 60 years of polar bear population. It's increasing. Yeah. And you yeah. have that in the palm of your hand. Well, you know, facts are overrated, Greg. <laughs> 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 Especially uh, inconvenient facts. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, so this, so it is, uh, if you go to the uh, Google Play Store, hopefully it'll be available tomorrow for iPhone, but uh, Android's available. It's called Inconvenient Space Facts, Inconvenient Facts, and uh the website's inconvenientfacts.xyz. Okay, cool. So inconvenientfacts.xyz, and the book is mm-hmm. called Inconvenient Facts, available in all the usual places until Amazon bans you because, you know, they don't like opposing viewpoints. And Jeff Bezos, we know what he thinks, and that's the deal. <laughs> but but exactly. hey, even if I don't agree with your message, you know, I want you to get some opposing viewpoints out there, right? And And, and folks, everybody listening should want that because it just makes people think. And uh, that is a good thing to make people think. So keep up the good work, Greg. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.